This lecture is on skin structure and function. It's an introduction to the integumentary system. In this lecture, we will describe the major functions of the skin, the structure and function of all layers of the skin, including the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous or hypodermis layer, and we will talk about the major cell and tissue types found in the skin. The integumentary system makes up 20% of your total body weight. It is in direct exposure to the sun, exposure to the environment, to chemicals, abrasives, and microorganisms. It has extensive connections to the cardiovascular system for blood supply and to the nervous system for sensory input. The skin is an indicator for general health. As we'll see, it has a lot of immune cells, which can trigger the inflammatory or immune reactions and act as sentinels for the immune system. Physical examination of the skin is also a very important part of the overall review of a patient's general health. So the integumentary system is made up of the skin, which is technically the cutaneous membrane. The skin then has two major layers the deep dermis, and then the layer above or the outermost layer, which is the epidermis. Epidermis means above or upon. Underneath the dermis is the subcutaneous layer, which is composed primarily of adipose tissue. In a separate lecture, we will talk about the accessory structures of the skin, the hair, the nails, and the glands found within the skin. There are many functions to the integumentary system. First is as a layer of protection for the body. It's protection against pathogens, a barrier for pathogen entry, and part of the innate defenses of the immune system. Protection against UV radiation and harmful chemicals. The skin also has a role in waste excretion through the sweat glands. The skin is an important insulator which is both important for heat and cooling of the body. The skin produces melanin, which is a pigment against UV radiation. It produces keratin, which is a tough water repellent surface for the skin. It synthesizes vitamin D, which we will cover in a separate lecture. Its important role in calcium metabolism and its newly proposed role in systemic health. The large layer of adipose tissue in the subcutaneous region is important for fat storage in the body. The skin has a lot of sensation, including touch, pressure, pain, vibration, and temperature receptors. And as I said, the immune response in the skin can be the first layer of defense of the innate defenses and can also trigger the inflammatory response. So let's start with the layers of the skin. You can come back to this slide when we're done. We're gonna go through each one of these layers in detail. So we'll start with the epidermis. The epidermis is the outermost layer of the skin. Epi again means above or upon. It's above or upon the dermis. The epidermis has continuous renewal like other epithelial tissues. It has an average turnover of about 30 days, which is fairly quick and it's composed primarily of keratinized, stratified, squamous epithelium. So what does that mean? It means it's many, many layers of squamous epithelium that contains keratin, and I'll show you those cells in a moment. If we zoom in on this image here, what I want you to notice is the epidermis layer here. So if we look at this wavy boundary, down at the bottom of this purple colored structure, that is the boundary between the epidermis and the dermis. All those tiny little purple dots are meant to represent some of the cellular layers within the epidermis. I also want you to notice that there's a large portion of the epidermis which is composed of keratinized or dead skin cells. That's the outermost protective layer of the skin. The epidermis is made of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So remember that stratified squamous means many layers of flattened cells. And keratin and the related proteins are tough, fibrous, and waterproof. There's also glycoproteins within the epidermis, and this is a film of lipids, which also produce a barrier within the skin. 
I want you to notice that the epidermis is avascular. It has no blood vessels. That means that it must receive its nutrients by diffusion from the underlying connective tissue of the dermis below. Let's look in detail at the five layers of the epidermis. In this image, what you're seeing is a microscope image of a slice of thick skin of the epidermis. Note that there's also a type of skin, the majority of skin in the body is thin skin. But here, this is a really nice way to see the difference between the layers, so I've chosen a, a diagram of thick skin. So the outermost layer is the stratum corneum. This is the keratinized layer of dead cells at the outermost surface of the skin. That's this entire dark layer. And again, because this is thick skin, it's a very thick, many, many layers for the stratum corneum here. Just underneath the stratum corneum is a layer of stratum lucidum. It's called stratum lucidum because it often doesn't stain well in these tissue samples. Lucidum meaning light, the light passes through the stratum lucidum. Stratum lucidum is only found in thick skin. Underneath the stratum lucidum is the stratum granulosum. Named that because when it is stained, it has a grainy appearance. Underneath the stratum granulosum is the stratum spinosum because the cells appear more spiny in shape. And finally, the very bottom layer of the epidermis is the stratum basal. It's important to see the stratum basal as the basal layer of the skin, which contains stem cells, proliferative cells, which are going to give rise to the rest of the layers of the skin. So the stratum basal produces the skin cells, and they slowly migrate upward towards the stratum corneum as they age over the course of that 30 days. As they migrate upwards into the stratum corneum, they become more and more keratinized. They start to lose their organelles and they become dead skin cells once they get to the very top layer. So the surface layers of the skin are dead, cornified or keratinized cells. And it's the bottom layers of the epidermis that give rise to the outermost layers. This is important when you learn about skin cancers because there's certain portions of the epidermis that can give rise to different types of skin cancers and certain cell types that are more proliferative are more likely to become cancerous cells. So let's look at the cell types found within the epidermis. Three main cell types that we would like for you to know. The keratinocytes are the majority of skin cells. That's 99% of cells that you're seeing in these diagrams. Again, these are the epithelial cells that form that stratified squamous layer. They're filled with keratin, especially as you move to the higher layers of the epidermis, and that's a water-resistant, tough, fibrous protein related to intermediate filament protein. If you want to know how tough keratin is, take a moment right now to feel your fingernails. Your fingernails, your fingernails are also composed of keratin. Evolutionarily, this is related to the scales of scaly animals. So our skin, including our nails and our hair, is all scaly. And it's scaly because of that keratin protein. Also in the epidermis, we have immune cells. The immune cells within the epidermis are called Mangerhan cells. They have a very important immune function, both in macrophage-like activity, engulfing pathogens and cellular debris within the skin, but also as antigen-presenting cells. Antigen-presenting cells, if you remember from our immune system lecture, take up pathogens and present any antigens that are found to the surface of those cells so that the immune cells can recognize and seek out those antigens within the body. These Langerhans cells can even migrate to lymph nodes to act like immune sentinels, presenting antigens to the immune cells so that the immune cells can recognize that pathogens have entered the skin. 
The last cell type found within the epidermis are melanocytes. You may have heard of the pigment melanin. Melanin is an important pigment produced by melanocytes, which are found in the basal layer of the epidermis. That's here in this diagram. So again, here's this wavy layer at the bottom of the epidermis. So this would be our stratum basal. And then here, this cell, which is kind of diagrammed in this orangish brown color, is a, representing a melanocyte, which is producing this melanin pigment and injecting that pigment into the layers above. Melanin is important for absorbing UV radiation, and it helps prevent tissue and DNA damage. It also helps to determine skin color. I always get this question from my students, so I added this slide years ago. What determines skin and hair color? So all people have the same relative numbers and types of skin cells, but the levels of pigment production vary across individuals. So we all have approximately the same number of melanocytes, but how active those melanocytes are can vary. So skin and hair color are primarily due to the types of melanin and the amount of melanin within the skin and the hair. There's two main types of melanin genetically determined. Pheomelanin is a red to yellow pigment. Eumelanin is a brown to black pigment. So what I always say to my students is, we have beautiful variation in our skin and hair color but it all comes from the same number of cells. So isn't it ridiculous that we judge each other based on the activity of our melanocytes? How silly is that? Skin color and hair color is simply a difference in the activity of melanocytes and the amount of melanin. That's all it is. There are other influences on skin color. Bilirubin levels in the body can create a yellow, which we refer to as a jaundiced appearance if bilirubin levels are high. Carotene, which is available from the diet, is an orangish yellow color. And also blood flow is an important contributor to the color of skin. An increased circulation will be pink or red. A decrease in blood flow will be pale or white. And a lack of oxygen to certain areas of the skin because of the change in the color of hemoglobin can create a more cyanotic or blue tone to the skin in that area. All right, let's talk about thick versus thin skin. So the image that I showed you was this one. That's thick skin and that's determined by how big or how thick the stratum corneum layer is within the epidermis. Thick skin is found on the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, and it can be up to one and a half millimeters thick. It has all five layers of the epidermis, and the difference is how thick the stratum corneum is. Thin skin is found on the rest of the body, and it can be as thin as 0.3 millimeters. Think of how thin the skin is over the eyelids. That's very, very thin. Thin skin is only four layers because it doesn't have a stratum lucidum, and it's thin because it has a thinner stratum corneum than thick skin. Interestingly, it is thick skin and the epidermal ridges of thick skin that create fingerprints. Within those epidermal ridges is a unique pattern across individuals, and that's where we get fingerprints from. Okay, now to the dermis. The dermis lies deep to the epidermis, so it's below the epidermis. It's a strong, elastic, and flexible layer filled with blood vessels and sensory receptors. It's about one to four millimeters thick, and it's made up of connective tissue, blood vessels, lymphatics, sensory cells, and nerves. So if we look in this diagram here again, look underneath this wavy line, this whole area is the dermis, all of this. So notice within the dermis that you see blood vessels, which are diagrammed in red and blue, lymphatics, which are colored in green, and then the sensory cells, some of these gray structures and nerve endings that are diagrammed here. There's two main connective tissue layers of the dermis. The layer closest to the epidermis is called the papillary layer. Papilla means little bumps. So the papillary layer is what produces those ridges underneath the epidermis. It's made up of areolar connective tissue, which is a loose connective tissue. 
and it has blood vessels, lymphatics, nerves, and sensory cells, as we said in the previous slide. Deep to the papillary layer is the reticular layer. It's the deepest layer of the dermis, and it's made up of dense, irregular connective tissue. Within the reticular layer is where you will find the base of the hair follicles and the base of the sweat in sebaceous glands. The cells found in the dermis are primarily three types. The fibroblasts are the connective tissue forming cells. We talked about this in the tissues lecture. They form the matrix of the connective tissue throughout the dermis, and they're the primary cells found within the dermis. Remember for connective tissue that the cells are also surrounded by a fibrous matrix. Within that matrix, we have collagen fibers and elastin fibers. We also have immune cells found within the dermis, primarily mast cells. Mast cells contain granules of histamine and heparin. They're coated with IgE, which creates allergy and even leading up to anaphylaxis reactions. Finally, there are also macrophages, which are phagocytic immune cells found within the dermis. So bottom line, the dermis is primarily connective tissue filled with collagen and elastin fibers produced by fibro fibroblasts. It also contains blood vessels, nerves, lymphatics, and immune cells. Blood supply to the skin is limited to the dermis. Vasoconstriction and vasodilation is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system, specifically in the skin, the alpha adrenergic receptors. To release heat, the blood vessels in the skin will vasodilate. To conserve heat, the blood vessels in the skin will vasoconstrict. For example, activation of the sympathetic nervous system causes vasoconstriction, which can lead to cold, clammy hands as the blood flow is being diverted to other areas of the body. The subcutaneous layer is also called the hypodermis. It's deep to the dermis, and it's composed mostly of adipose tissue with some areolar connective tissue. It anchors the skin to the underlying muscle below, and it allows the skin to slide relatively freely on the surface of the muscle. This storage of adipose tissue can provide an energy reserve, insulation, and shock absorption. It also turns out to be a handy place to do subcutaneous injections. So a subcutaneous injection is where you lift up the skin to get underneath to that subcutaneous layer and perform the injection right in that fat layer before you get to the muscle. Here's an overview of the integumentary system that we've discussed so far. So the integumentary system is composed of the skin, which is the cutaneous membrane, made up of the epidermis and the dermis. Below that would be the subcutaneous or hypodermis layer. In the next lecture, we will talk about accessory structures of the skin, the hair follicles, the glands, and the nails. Take a look at the labels and the anatomy of this image See if you can get rid of those labels and re-label everything on here and test your knowledge of the anatomy. All right, that's it. Let me know if you have any questions.